Thank you very much, Tim, and uh, welcome all to the uh, State of the Net Conference. Let's give Tim Lorton and all of his team a round of applause for organizing another great conference. Uh, the reason we're starting a little bit early is that, uh, uh, as you know, the House is in session, and uh, out of uh, great respect for my position as co-chair of the Internet Caucus, uh, the leadership scheduled votes begin <laughs> sometime between 1.30 and 2. So my beeper is going to go off and you'll see me disappear uh, pretty rapidly. And if we're not through with this, then maybe Tim or somebody will come up and, uh, and we'll finish the conversation. But uh, uh, it is a great opportunity uh, today to talk to a great innovator uh, in the field of technology, someone who has uh, worked in this field for uh, more years than I realized, and what, uh, what uh, made me aware of that was that he, he uh, started his career on the staff of U.S. Senator Bill Bradley, uh, who's been, been gone for a while. So. <laughs> but uh, he has gone on to uh, uh, a number of other uh, very interesting uh, uh, places. Uh, he uh, uh, worked at ADAC Labs in Booz Allen Hamilton. He was a, a co-founder and the CEO of Evite. Uh, uh, a leading social planning uh, event site on the web, and uh, he was a, a uh, uh, an officer executive with eBay for a long. We've just been talking about doing business on eBay, and uh, he was the CEO of Shopping.com, uh, and that's uh, before things really took off uh, as uh, one of the uh, founders of Skype. And as the president of the company, he oversees the uh, company's direction and strategy and manages its day-to-day -day operations. And his priorities are to support the team in building the world's greatest communication products by making sure that everyone is rowing in the same direction every day. I told him that my son worked for Facebook, and I knew what that was like. Uh, they have an adult who uh, supervises uh, uh, operations there as well. And I think that maybe more than one by the, 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 op the, the uh, uh, situation may be similar at Skype. So uh, please welcome Josh Silverman. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, uh, Brown University and uh, Stanford University School of Business, and uh, he is uh, a passionate salsa dancer, according to the. So uh, he also uh, participates in uh, any kind of sport. He says especially sand volleyball. I've always, always known that as beach volleyball, but since he lives in London, that may, may explain why they don't claim it to be beach volleyball. Uh, and uh, he also engages in high-speed chases around his house with his three-year-old and one-year-old, and occasionally he breaks a sweat playing guitar hero. Uh, as that three-year-old and one-year-old get older, uh, you'll be spending even more time on guitar hero and related uh, uh, venues. So, uh, Josh, would you like to say a few words to open up here? And then Absolutely. we'll jump well, into some questions. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I really appreciate it. One minor note of, uh, of uh, correction. I, I was not a co-founder of Skype. My suit would be more finely tailored <laughs> if I was. I joined the company in late February as the president and CEO of Skype, and I'm delighted to be here. I thank you all very much for, uh, for inviting me to come and, and have a conversation with, with all of you. I'd also like to thank all of you for dedicating so much of your time and energy to uh, creating public policy in the U.S. that's about innovation and change and the future, which is so important for Skype and for job creation and for uh, all of us everywhere. So thank you very much for that. I encounter uh, various levels of awareness about Skype. Uh, can you just tell us uh, uh, a little bit about the company so that uh, those who are catching up on the subject can uh, uh, be up to date on the latest things that you're doing now? Great. We'd be delighted to. So Skype is a, a little piece of software that you download onto your computer that allows you to communicate with any other Skype user anywhere in the world. And a couple of points of definition. When I say computer, what I mean by that is more and more any computing device. It may be a laptop. It may be a desktop uh, going forward, uh, mobile devices. And, and uh, uh, so many devices with a computing chip in them now are connected to the internet. Any one of those devices in the future should be able to. It's our aspiration should be able to run Skype. And when I talk about uh, communicate, in the old world, communication really meant voice communication, having a voice conversation. 
our users use Skype for a very, very broad range of communication. We have something called Mood Message, which is sort of like a Twitter uh, chat, uh, instant messaging, voice communication, video calling, uh, screen sharing, so m multiple different people can be viewing the same PowerPoint presentation, for example, and, and talking about it, uh, exchanging files, and et cetera, et cetera. So that w when we speak about communication, we speak broadly about the full plethora of communication. The service is pretty popular, uh, so uh, we announced at the end of last quarter about 370 million users around the world. Uh, we add about 300,000 new users each day. Uh, on Christmas Day this year in the United States, we added about 120,000 users in the United States on that one day. Uh, we do more than 15 billion minutes per quarter of communication. Uh, it's a big number. To put that in perspective, it's uh, more than 7% of the world's international calling minutes are now happening on Skype. Uh, another interesting fact, over 30% of those calling minutes are actually video calls. So video for us is very much the present day, not the future. Where do you see yourself going from here? What's your business model? So the, a lot of people ask me, how do we make money? Uh, and uh, we give away something for free that doesn't cost anything. And in exchange for that, we attract millions and millions of users each month, some of whom uh, choose to buy our paid products. So if you want to use Skype to communicate with any other Skype user, that's free. If you want to use Skype to communicate with people over the PSTN or mobile networks, we charge a very small fee on the order of two to three cents a minute, for example, to call to Europe. Um, and uh, uh, that, that translates to uh, something in the order of $146 million in revenue last quarter and our seventh consecutive quarter of profitability. In terms of the policy positions that we've been working with in, in uh, uh, Washington, D.C., we're active in a broad range of policy areas. Uh, our main goal is to make sure that consumers have choice when it comes to communication, and especially you'll see us active on issues of net neutrality, wireless openness, universal service reform, and uh, next generation 911. I talk a lot in the Congress about competitiveness in the global economy and the importance of creating an environment uh, that encourages investment in entrepreneurship and that eliminates unnecessary hurdles. Skype has a large office in Estonia, which I've had the opportunity to visit. Uh, why did Skype locate in Estonia, and what can U.S. policymakers do to attract uh, tech companies here? Obviously, we have a lot of them. We want all of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the right aspiration. That's exactly what the U.S. should want, right? Um, First, I'm so delighted that you've been to our office in Estonia, and I think that says a lot about you. Uh, Estonia is a country of 1.6 million people. It's a former Soviet republic, and for um, those who don't have PhDs in geography, it's a, a short boat ride away from Helsinki and uh, just due west of St. Petersburg. Um, so Skype uh, does have a very large office in Estonia because the original engineers who built Skype were Estonian. And in fact, uh, less than 20 engineers based in a country that most people have never heard of uh, changed the world overnight in September of 2003. And I think that's a very important lesson for the United States that uh, in today's world, innovation can and does come from every part of the world. And we cannot take for granted the United States' historical leadership in technology and in innovation. I point to broadband internet access. I, I think we all find it unacceptable that the United States isn't even in the top 10 for broadband internet access. In fact, Estonia, which is only about 15 years away from Soviet rule, I believe has higher broadband internet penetration than does the United States. I'd also look at innovation in mobile applications where those who follow the sector would look at Asia really as the leader right now in what's happening in cutting edge mobile. So we all uh, aspire to, uh, I'm sure the people in this room aspire to the United States having 100% of uh, the innovation in the world, but I think we have some work to do to make sure that that. Uh, short, short of that, any particular areas you think the Congress uh, should be focusing on to change the atmosphere, the environment for investment in the U.S.? 
Well, there's a couple of areas that we're, we're especially concerned about. The number one is, is net neutrality. Uh, we think that in order to continue to have innovation at the edge of the network, it's super important that the people that control access to the network don't get to pick and choose which content and which applications consumers have a right to view. And if you think back to 1995 and AOL, you subscribed to AOL and AOL dictated to you what the internet looked like and consumers have greatly benefited as the world has evolved. We want to make sure that, um, that we see that openness continue. We'd also look at wireless openness as another area where we think um, it's extremely important in a related area that uh, consumers continue to have a choice of network provider and wireless application, and that those two are separate and, and equal choices. Um, we also think that uh, the work that um, the Congress is starting to take up right now and that uh, President-elect Obama has uh, pushed on uh, a stimulus package that includes broadband internet access, we're very supportive of that. We believe that um, more access to broadband uh, services and faster and better access is incredibly important to the continued competitiveness of the United States and to consumers being part of the global conversation. Trademarks are a valuable resource to companies like yours and have significant name recognition and companies often harness the power of their trademarks by using them in the domain names that they register. There has been a lot of discussion lately around here about ICANN's recent plan to begin accepting applications for uh, a, an explosion, a uh, numerous new generic top-level domains uh, by mid this year. Uh, what's your opinion of that proposal and how would it affect Skype's ability to protect its trademarks? So actually, uh, on that question in particular, I'm not sure I'm uh, the best to, uh, to respond. We, we have a pretty limited uh, trademark portfolio. The Skype brand is pretty discreet. Um, and so we'd be happy to work with ICANN, but um, I, I, I don't have a strong position on that particular No, area. No opinion on whether we need to have uh, as many dot different states and dot cars and so on as are being proposed now in the dramatic I, change. I know that we're running out of dot coms. You know, I've seen studies that show that uh, uh, there's uh, something like five times as many registered dot com trademarks as there are words in the Webster's Dictionary. And so uh, you have to be pretty inventive to come up with a new brand these days. So I'm very sympathetic to the concerns of folks that are trying to uh, to be able to promote a new brand in, in this space and also concerns around domain squatting. I'm very sympathetic to that. We also don't want to create mass confusion among consumers who are only now figuring out how to use the URL bar um, and still mostly navigate via search engines. Um, so I understand both sides of the issues um, and we'll be supportive. Very good. I'd imagine Skype services like its video chat and conferencing services are bandwidth intensive and in that the quality of services depends on the quality of users broadband connections, how has the economic downturn affected broadband deployment, broadband subscription rates, and your business? So first I'd like to address the bandwidth in intensive uh, point. You, you may be surprised to learn that Skype's actually not uh, bandwidth intensive. Our whole business is figuring out how to uh, take voice or video communications, uh, encode them to be very, very compact and yet to retain really rich quality. So if you've been on a Skype call, you'll notice that in general it's actually much richer than uh, your traditional PSTN call. The sound quality is, is actually significantly better. And yet a voice call on Skype requires only 22 kilobits per second. That's kilobits, not megabits. And to get high quality video, which is uh, a really rich, I, I do high quality video calls all day, it's projected at 60 inches, and you'll get a really clear, crisp, image at 60 inches, we can do that for 382 kilobits per second in upstream speed. Uh, so we think we're, we're quite good at using bandwidth uh, effectively. That's why when we hear concerns from network providers about, uh, you know, uh, network management, uh, we're a little concerned that, that uh, it isn't only network management that they're really trying to protect. 
Um, in terms of the economy, though, uh, it is services like Skype that are really helping people to uh, make their dollar go further. The ability to call people for free uh, or very cheap is obviously of great benefit. But even more than that, um, I would imagine that in your district, you'll find there's people who are conducting businesses on Skype. There's people who uh, used to have to get on a plane and go and uh, do a meeting across the country who are now choosing to do video conferencing for free on Skype. Uh, partners, family members where the husband and wife have to live in different cities to maintain a job and they're able to, to keep a family connection and keep close with their kids via video conferencing. People working from home more and more often. So um, what we're actually seeing in our data is uh, we're growing faster now than we were a year ago. And for a company with over 370 million registered users, that's a pretty uncommon thing to say. Absolutely. Uh, have, has Skype been affected by the uh, economic downturn? Is it we, uh, from what I can tell, so one of the interesting things about being a five-year-old company, we were only formed in 2003. So we've never been through an economic cycle before, and I can't tell you whether we're counter-cyclical or not. What I can say is that uh, our user metrics are growing very, very nicely, and as I said, even faster now than they were a year ago. It doesn't appear that the economy, from what we can do parsing out the data, it doesn't appear that the economy is affecting us to the positive or to the negative. It, it appears that the, the um, increase in usage we're seeing is coming primarily from quality, so just getting ever easier to use and ever more reliable from video, um, and from uh, just more and more people becoming aware. Oprah has, in the United States, uh, taken quite a passion for Skype. And uh, for all of the fanatic Oprah users out there, you might notice that Oprah watches. She, uh, she actually uses Skype as an integral part of the Oprah show quite regularly, one out of every three or four shows now. She's actually bringing viewers onto the show via Skype. And so where you used to have to send someone to a satellite uplink center and spend tens of thousands of dollars here, Mary in her home with her own two-year-old Dell computer and $50 webcam can have a video call with Skype that's high enough quality that she's broadcast on national television. And so, uh, you know, watching the uh, Republican and, Nas and Democratic National Conventions this year, many of the local uh, news affiliates chose to use Skype to broadcast. Um, so when you think about what Skype is or what software and communication companies are now, is it a communications company, is it a telco, is it a software company, is it a broadcasting company? These anachronistic definitions that were designed for companies of the late 1800s and early 1900s are stretched to breaking in, in our present world. Well, let's take some questions uh, from the audience. Do we have uh, the ability to do that? Yes, we do. All right. Who's got the first one? This gentleman right here in the middle. Happy day. Uh, uh, ask your question. You mentioned universal service reform and E911. Those are both issues that have been before the FCC. Would you comment on Skype's position on those issues, particularly in comparison to one of the sponsors here, Verizon, and how you characterize your responsibilities, that being Skype, to fund universal service reform, I should say universal service availability, on E911 uh, availability at the local level, and also to uh, to pay state and local taxes, which is another responsibility that Verizon and, and similar companies have. So I'd be happy to comment on Skype's position, and Verizon will be happy to comment on, on their position. Um, so uh, our position is we're first very big supporters of universal service reform. Uh, just in the nature of our business, we think we do quite a lot to help with uh, extending communications to people all around the world. Uh, well over 90% of all communications happen on Skype for free, and uh, free beats cheap all the time. Second, uh, we think that broadband access is incredibly important to people uh, all around the world. It is core to becoming part of the global economy and the, the global conversation. I grew up in, in Michigan. And it used to be 30 or 40 years ago that farmers in Michigan may not have felt the need to learn foreign languages, to study the global markets. Talk to farmers today in Michigan, and they know the commodities prices everywhere around the world better than you or I. 
right? So uh, it's very important that everyone have access and be tied in. The incentive system that we have today around the way that we bring network access to people uh, I think could be improved. We uh, auction bandwidth for billions of dollars, often, most often to the highest bidder or something close to it, and then uh, ask the network providers to fully fund uh, all of the access that they're bringing to the cost of billions of dollars. Therefore, there's an incredibly high barrier to entry to becoming a network provider, all of which is passed straight through to the consumer in the form of higher fees and often in the form of policies that we think are more restrictive than uh, we sometimes would like in terms of really fostering an open internet. It is businesses like Skype, we think, that provide one of the killer apps why you would want broadband internet access. Why do you want Fios in the home? One of the big reasons is that you can have a video call with your son who's just gone off to college or your grandchild who lives 3,000 miles away. It's a killer app for getting broadband access over just dial-up. So we think we provide a valuable service in driving the penetration and making people want to pay for those services. We're very supportive of Senator Obama's, or sorry, uh, President-elect Obama's uh, proposal uh, for a stimulus plan that will uh, further fund broadband access into all parts of the country and, and uh, including rural areas. We'd love to see some subsidies to make that happen to lower the barriers for access providers so that they don't have such enormous capital costs. Second uh, question you raised was with regards to um, E911 and uh, access to emergency services are I incredibly important, obviously, uh, for everyone. Uh, what's most important is that they work every single time you pick up the phone. And that's why we think that the Congress and FCC did the right thing when they defined uh, 911 as required for landline replacement services. Uh, Skype is a piece of software that is not a landline uh, service replacement. It doesn't work if your internet access uh, isn't turned on at the moment or is spotty. And the last thing on earth we would want is to have someone be in a situation where they uh, think that Skype is delivering 911 service for them, uh, only to try to make the call at the critical time and have it not work. So we're looking and working together with uh, uh, the technology industry and the regulators to figure out ways to make 911 really uh, more relevant in today's technology environment so that it works 99.99999% of the time and not anything less than that. We have another question right here. Jeff? Hi. Um, I was uh, wondering a couple of quick questions. One, what does Skype think about uh, smart networks that allow users to prioritize a VoIP service of their choice? Uh -huh. um, and secondly, are you guys doing, you mentioned your whole company's about kind of squeezing down, but there's also this introduction of full fiber networks that is opening up endless amounts of bandwidth, and are you guys thinking at all about what you can do to use more bandwidth instead of less? Uh, well, we're, we see ourselves as, as the advocate for the consumer and believe that when the consumer wins, we will all win. And so anything that provides lowest cost routing from smart devices and other things, um, which frankly makes the world even more competitive for us, we think is the right thing, and we're, we're, we're very supportive of, of that. Um, we always want to use as little bandwidth as possible. Um, and uh, so we're, we're always trying to figure out how to uh, be as good as we can at, at compression. I will say that the concerns about we're going to run out of bandwidth, um, I'm, I'm leery about. You know, Intel could have said 15 years ago, gosh, the 386 processing platform is just about maxed out. So, uh, God forbid, let's not have any 3D games out there. Let's not have any uh, supercomputing applications. Not, let's not have parallel processing. And that would have been the wrong answer, obviously, for the industry. Instead, there's been this great symbiotic relationship between, for example, uh, software uh, application providers, video game manufacturers, and others who have been creating the demand for ever faster chips. In the same way, it is application companies like Skype bringing things like rich video casting into the home and office, which are creating demand for more bandwidth, which uh, is exactly what the folks who are in the business of providing that access um, uh, we, we think will we'll prosper. So all of us, we think, will prosper in a symbiotic ecosystem in the future. 
We have a gentleman out here. Yep. You. Yep. No, I, I guess. Well, okay. Um, let's see. I've been hearing the term broadband used quite extensively at this meeting. So I was wondering if you could quantify what you mean by broadband. Second, do you think it has to be symmetric? Remember, the internet was originally intended to be a symmetric communication system, but that's not what we really have today. And third, do you think that in considering the definition of broadband for the U.S., we should take into account definition as used in, say, Korea and Japan? Um, so uh, in terms of my definition for broadband, um, uh, you're right, I've been using it rather loosely, and we've been referring to anything faster than a dial-up. <laughs> So DSL, and, and that's because in, in, in our world, uh, the kinds of services that we're able to support uh, can be supported quite easily on even a rather rudimentary DSL network. Now, in a policy framework, when we think about, for example, a stimulus package that promotes broadband Internet access, what we think um, the government's responsibility there, we're talking about taxpayer dollars. So it, it is fair that you have uh, a quid pro quo that you ask in return. And we think that as the government were to subsidize broadband access, you should be demanding that that access be provided in an open way so packets are not discriminated by the access provider. And also that you should be demanding a higher standard in terms of what that access is. And we think symmetric access greater than 50 megabytes per second is required to push the industry beyond where it is today. Any standard less than that is really just uh, supporting the, the, the status quo. Let's see. Uh, sorry to make you run around so much, but in the back. Do we have somebody over here? Too? I just wanted to um, get back to the mobile issues for a second. Skype has been a real leader um, and spent a lot of time in DC on mobile openness issues. Uh, and I'm curious how you foresee your interactions with the carriers going forward, particularly uh, under the oversight of a new Congress and new administration? So we're uh, very anxious to, to work with the mobile operators to come up with win-win models uh, for them and for us. They provide a very, very valuable service. They lay out a lot of capital to provide that access to, um, to operators. We think we also provide a very valuable service that's very in demand by consumers, and we're pretty confident that we can come up with win-win models. If I can give one example there, in, um, in Europe, we have a relationship with a mobile operator called Three. This is an operator owned by the um, Hutchinson uh, uh, franchise out of Asia. And uh, there they've brought to market, actually I have one with me, uh, the Three Skype phone. So they divide, designed a piece of hardware which is purpose built for Skype. So when you open it up, the first thing you see is your Skype contact list with presence and you have the ability to call over their 3G network or call Skype to Skype or call Skype out. You can chat. You can All the chats you've had on your desktop follow you on the phone, et cetera, et cetera. And what we've seen with this um, relationship we have with 3 is, first, it's their best-selling phone. They sold over 300,000 units in the first six months with virtually no marketing. Second, it's their most profitable phone. They don't have to subsidize the handset. It doesn't need to be a brand name handset because it has Skype on it. And people will buy it just for the fact that it has Skype on it. Third, and perhaps more surprisingly, the revenue per user per month is actually higher on this phone than it is on all of the traditional phones that they sell. Why is that? Well, people are using Skype a lot on the phone. In fact, 100 minutes per user per month. But they're also using the traditional 3G network. They're doing a lot of standard cellular calls. They're becoming ever more reliant on the device. And where they used to maybe have two or three or four different phones that they would use and juggle, a landline, a home phone, this phone, suddenly this now is enough value for them that it's the only phone they use. So they're making more revenue per user on it. They've got lower churn. They've got almost no customer acquisition cost. They didn't have to subsidize the, uh, the handset. And uh, perhaps the, the most interesting news for them, 79% of people who bought the phone were not three subscribers before. They switched networks just to have this product. So for them, it's a no-brainer. They've got low acquisition cost, high profit, and the only thing they gave up was international calling revenue, which for the vast majority of mobile operators is really a tiny niche revenue stream for them anyway. So we're, we're pretty confident that we can come up with win-wins 
with, uh, with the mobile operators and, and ourselves and the device manufacturers. And the reason is the consumer wins. Okay. Sir. Uh, yes. Uh, you, you actually almost answered my question because I was going to ask you about the mobile uh, and the tree relationship as well. Uh, the question I, I, I have to ask you is this, uh, the concept of the converged address book. And I think that is the holy grail of a lot of applications on the web and the mobile yep. web. And I think that is one of the main reasons people use Skype, including me, is because you actually have the single point of contact. And as it comes to the phone, this will become more interesting. So this, I just want your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And if you don't mind, if I pull way up from that, um, and I will get to that point. But where I see us in, in communications today, I think that, that the industry of communications is at a fundamental tipping point right now where it has transformed from being a hardware service to a software service. What I mean by that is if you cast your mind back 15 years, you'll remember that clunky dedicated appliance we all had called the telephone. And it was tied to a dedicated network we had, which was the twisted pair copper network. And if you think about the way communications happen today, I'm going to pull out one more device, uh, my BlackBerry. Uh, if you think about even an iPhone, uh, so most of us serve. Most of us communicate today on multi-purpose computing devices, which happen to be mobile. And we use these multi-purpose computing devices for an ever-expanding range of things, checking stock prices, downloading music, downloading movies. Uh, all kinds of different things. Only one of those applications happens to be communication, and when we use it for communication, we use it for many, many different modes of communication. So to bring this to life, something that we talk about in our office is an anecdote where I'm on a multi-chat with four different people from my company talking about a new product launch. Uh, I click a button, and that becomes a multi-party video call uh, because we realize we really need to get to closure on this quickly. We're having a multi-party video call I need to step away to get to another appointment. It transfers to my BlackBerry, and now it's a conference call. I get in my car, it moves over the Bluetooth, and now we're having a, a conference call on Bluetooth. I walk into my home, I wave it to my flat panel TV, and it becomes a multi-party video call on my flat panel TV again. I close off that call, I walk into the kitchen, I'm making something, I can't remember how to make this dish. I call my mother-in-law on the, the television panel that's on my refrigerator, she reminds me again how to do it, and I hang up the call, and, and off I go. Does that happen often? <laughs> <laughs> Everything I just described is technologically possible today, where all computing devices are connected to a multipurpose network called the Internet, and communication flows like water from mode to mode and from device to device. The only thing that's stopping this at this point is really the regulatory framework. When I pull it back and look at the regulatory framework, when I was in my office doing that multi-party video call, I was on a fiber line, which is regulated by one set of uh, regulations, fortunately Carter phone being part of that, so I can attach any device. When that moved to my wireless, that's an entirely different regulatory framework. And when I waved it to that flat panel TV in the home, since I was getting cable internet access there, that's yet another regulatory framework, none of which are appropriately designed for the communications framework of today. So we believe there ought to be one framework for how conversations and communications are managed. It ought to set rest on a very few set of core principles, openness being one of the most important. And you know, when we think about then what communications is, there are a few sets of core services like address book, like presence, like voice and video, that follow you from device to device. And all of that is enabled only when communication is embedded in the software layer and not the hardware or the network. I think we have time for one more question, and you get the last word. Thank you. Mike Nelson with Georgetown University. Josh, last time we talked, we were in Korea back in June at the OECD meeting on the Internet economy. And I was curious, when you were in Korea, did you have time to see some of the things that were going on there, and particularly what they're doing with IPv6 and the Internet of Things? You, you've been talking about person-to-person -person communication for the most part, but we're five years away, at most ten years away, from a world where each of us have 50, maybe 100 different Internet-enabled devices, yeah. from the laptop to the television to the furnace to the dog collar to the light bulbs to the sprinkler system. 
is Skype looking at that opportunity, and do you see any, any low-hanging fruit there, any, any particular opportunities for uh, the Internet of Things, for device-to-device to device communication? Um, our, 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 our mission is enabling the world's conversations, and so our focus, uh, at least for what I hope is at least the next 10 years, is on person-to-person person because we think um, uh, it's so core to what we, what we do and what we are. Uh, I do think there's a huge opportunity for device to device to unlock a lot more efficiency in in the world. Maybe someday we'll get there, but um, uh, I care about people and connecting people. And, and, uh, so, thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, uh, some great questions. Uh, a great company. Uh, I represent a rural district in Southwest Virginia, and I know I have a great many Skype users. It's uh, really a way. Uh, to uh, advance technology and really to be able to do almost anything from uh, anywhere in the world. And we welcome your ongoing efforts and uh, any future input you might have uh, with us here in Washington and with the Congress on ways that we can help facilitate that uh, open communication uh, that uh, will make lives better for people around the world. Thanks. Let's give Josh Silverman a round of applause. Thank you, and thanks for all the leadership you've shown in Congress and also with the, the leadership you've shown in the Congressional Internet Caucus and, and all the efforts that you and, and the Internet Caucus are doing on, on the behalf of the American consumers. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Everybody.